Good evening. I'd like to call the March 24, 2020 regular City Council meeting to order. And I'd like to point out that this meeting is being hosted through live stream on the City's website and by teleconference for public comment. City staff is at an off-site location participating through video conference. If you are joining through teleconference, please mute your phone to prevent noise interference until you provide public comment. Due to the structure of this meeting, I would like to remind Council to have their microphones turned on and positioned so the audience can hear. And I beg everyone's indulgence as we uh, go through this. This is new uh, circumstances for all of us. Hi, so. Tom Jackson. Hi, Tom. Okay, Deputy City Clerk, may we have a roll call, please? Mayor Brown? Here. Mayor Pro Tem Krupa? Here. Councilor Meyer? Here. Councilor Bristol? Here. Councilor Wright? Here. Thank you. And before we proceed, I would like to uh, request that we change the agenda's order to accommodate the public who is joining us by teleconference. So I would like to move item nine public hearing to be heard directly following item five, the public comment period. This will allow the public to make comment via teleconference on all items listed on the agenda in one segment of the meeting. This will result in a renumbering of the agenda. After the conclusion of the public hearing item, the public teleconference line will then be deactivated. The public is encouraged to continue to watch live stream at hemetca.gov slash council chamber live. Again, that is hemetca.gov slash council chamber live. So with that, I will entertain a motion to change the order of the agenda. So moved. Second. Okay, I have a motion by council member Meyer and a, a tie for the second. I think uh, Linda was first. And we have a roll call vote, please. No. motion passes unanimously. With that, we will go on to our invocation. Uh, the Interfaith Council will not be in attendance today, so the invocation will be given by Mayor Pro Tem Linda Krupa, after which Council Member Bonnie Wright will lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Please stand. We're gathered here tonight to do the work of the city. And we ask, dear Lord, that you give us the wisdom and the patience to be here, to keep our six-foot distance, to be well aware of the fact that the entire community is facing the coronavirus epidemic, pandemic. We ask that our, your wisdom, your patience, and your compassion be distributed to everyone that is being affected by this deadly virus. And we pray that it will all be over soon, we will all survive, and that our economy will be back and our city will be back functional. We ask all this in your name. Amen. Amen. Please join for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Moving on now to item 4A, closed session report. The city attorney is participating via teleconference. So, Attorney Jex, can we get a report out from the 6 p.m. closed session? So, we currently can't hear us, so can you give me a second? I'm asking for his phone number so he can call in on my phone. Okay. Tom, this is Chris. I'm putting you on speaker right now at the dice. Okay, thank you. 
So, Tom, we're in regular session now, and uh, could we get a report out from the 6 p.m. closed session? Yes, thank you. The City Council met in closed session with respect to the three items on the closed session agenda, and there is no reportable action on any of those items, and that concludes the report. Thank you very much. We'll now move to item five, communications from the public. To accommodate public comment, we have made some temporary changes to part of our agenda that were necessitated to comply with the COVID-19 directives. There will be a temporary two-minute-per-person two time limit for all general public comments on non-public hearing items. All who wish to speak, including council members and staff, need to be recognized by the mayor before speaking. Members of the public shall comply with the adopted rules of decorum, Resolution 4545, a copy of which can be requested through the city clerk's office. You may also fill out a form and submit your comments online at www.hemetca.gov slash council chamber live, and it will be read aloud. Submittal must be done before 2 p.m. the day of the meeting. For those that wish to join by teleconferencing, you will be able to join by calling 888-585-9008. That's 888-585-9008. You will be prompted then to dial 768-176-0008. Again, when you're prompted, you will dial 768-176-038. You'll be asked for your name prior to speaking. As a reminder, if you're joining by teleconference, please mute your phone to prevent noise interference until you are given time to provide your public comments. And please state your name and item that you are commenting on before speaking. So public comments for items listed on the agenda, consent and discussion items. Deputy City Clerk, were there any e-comments submitted to be read aloud for consent calendar or discussion items? No, Mayor Brown, there are no uh, requests to speak. Okay. Are there any members of the public participating through teleconference that would like to comment on any consent calendar or discussion items? There's no one on the, on the teleconference line. Okay, moving on to item 5B, public comments for items not listed on the agenda but within jurisdictional matter. Deputy City Clerk, are there any e-comments submitted to be read aloud for non-agendized items? No, Mayor, there are no uh, e-comments submitted. Are there any members of the public participating through teleconference that would like to comment on any non-agendized items? There are no members of the public attending via teleconference. Okay, then we will move on to item six. So, Mayor, yes. uh, if I may, we're having some audio problems at City Hall, so if we could just take a brief recess so that we can reset the phone and get that squared away so that the staff can hear back at City Hall. Yes. Okay. So we're Just five minutes. Thank you. We'll be back in a moment. Welcome to Open Voice Audio Services. Please enter your conference room number followed by the pound or half sign. Tom, you still there? Conference room number accepted. If you are, please enter your PIN yes, followed by the pound yes. or hash sign. For a menu of available commands, press star 1. There is one other caller on the call. Hello, can you hear us? Yes. Yeah, now we can hear you. Okay, good. Tom, are you still there? Yes, I'm still here. Okay. So, Tom, do you have the call-in line 
That is 888-585-9008. Yeah, I still have that number. I'll hang up and call into that number. Okay, that'll work. Thanks. Okay. All right, bye. All right. Jax is here. Okay. So, technical gremlins have been chased off? Yes. Okay. We're back from recess, and we'll go into item six, public hearing. City Council's procedure for public hearings will be as follows. The mayor will ask for the staff report and clarification of items presented. The mayor will then open the public hearing, asking for comments from those in favor or in opposition to the item, followed by rebuttal to any comments made. The mayor will then close the public hearing and ask the city manager to respond to any questions raised by the public. The public will not have the opportunity to respond. The mayor will then bring the discussion back to the city council for direction or action. So we will move to the public hearing item which is an ordinance amending section 70-224 of article 8 parentheses security improvements of chapter 70 parentheses subdivisions of the Hemet municipal code relating to the city's acceptance of lien agreements as securities for subdivision improvement and I understand we have city engineer Lariso to give us a staff report welcome Thank you, Mayor, members of the Council. Make sure you can hear me. Uh, if you recall back in uh, the end of January, we had this, this item first on the agenda as the first reading. some brief background on it. So, uh, as it says up here, subdivision improvement agreements, um, that's required of all land subdivisions that we go through uh, within the city as well as throughout the state. That's required for the developers to provide uh, guarantees uh, to do the improvements that are required of, the, of their development. Uh, in addition, securities, which are required by the Subdivision Map Act, uh, we have only a certain kind that are allowed right now. And as you can see, we have bonds, letters of credit, and cash deposits. Those are the only three that we were currently allowing of the, of the developers. One reason why I wanted to bring this forward uh, was we've noticed that land development has been lagging in the region for some time. Uh, land developers are therefore experiencing somewhat of a difficulty to se get security on certain projects. Uh, this way of doing this new lien agreement really would help out those larger pieces of land that maybe haven't been developed or, or the owners hadn't thought about it yet because they didn't have the ability to provide some sort of security for that for the development. So there's two other agencies that, based on the research that I could find, that uh, allow these, Riverside County and Victorville. They both have ordinances in place. Uh, Victorville did theirs just a few years back as a, as a way to try to spur on some additional development. So as you can see, and as you mentioned, Mayor, uh, it's modifying a section of the, of the municipal code to basically allow lien agreements as one of the four options for providing securities. That is the extent of my presentation. Here for any questions you may have. 
Okay, so with that, I will open the public hearing. Deputy City Clerk, do you have any e-comments submitted to be read aloud on this item? No, Mayor, no e-comments were submitted. Are there any members of the public participating through teleconference that would like to comment on this item? Is there anyone on the line? Okay. Hearing none, I will now close the public hearing. Do any members of City Council have comments or questions? Okay, I do. Um, okay, so on the lien, um, it says on here like a two to three. I'm trying to find where I wrote. Two to three year. Could you just, I mean, is this going to be a lien on the property so that when they decide to sell it, we're going to get our money? Or... It well, says two to three years down here. Just explain that. So we end up in, being in the first position on the property for any liens. Um, so the lien's in place for up to three years with the possibility of extending it up to six years. And the intent really is not for us to get the money from the property because the idea would be to still develop it and do the improvements. It really is only for those improvements in the public right-of-way to make sure that they get done. Um, collecting the money is, is definitely spelled out within the, um, the resolution here. Mm -hmm. I just can't remember exactly. Um, where did you see that the, it was two years? Um, it's on, it's in the staff report on the mm -hmm. second page. Uh, it just has the amount of time. In, initial length would be three years. It's um, right above the coordination and public review. Okay. That paragraph. Yes, yeah, so, so that, uh, the lending agreements will require the, that the construction of public... Oh, not prior to two years. Gotcha. Okay, so yeah. I'm sorry. I had to back up there. So the idea by setting these securities in place or having a lien is that we don't expect the improvements needed within the first two years after the map is approved. We expect that after that point is when we really need the improvements. And likely by the time improvement plans are approved, that's about the time when things will go through. But before they do that, they would have to replace their security with traditional security, bonds, cash deposits, and such. Does that answer the question? Um, I think so. I'm comparing it to, like, say, the solar farm, Linda, how they didn't do what they were supposed to do, and so then we got the money and were able to uh, do the projects, right? Yeah. So why would we do this instead of that way? I want to know that. Like, from Mainly that. because that, that was a letter of credit. And we had the letter of credit on file so that when they did not do the improvements, we took that letter of credit in the actual amount of $3 million, $2.6 million, something like that, and we completed the off-site improvements. But this would be in addition to those types of uh, securities, correct? Correct. And, and let me offer, I think I heard now exactly what you're looking for. So we'll look at it this way. So with the solar farm, they started working on the improvements, right? Right. In this particular case, we are only allowing them to provide a security of a lien when the, in order to get the map recorded. There is no work that's going to happen on that site until they provide actual bonds of a dollar amount. So they may go through the whole process of getting plans reviewed by staff, getting them approved. Uh, the map will be approved by council. And that gives you the security in the first place. But they'll go through that process of having the plans reviewed. Nothing still has been constructed on site yet. So at that time, when those plans are approved and they want to go forward to start constructing, is when they have to replace the lien agreement with actual securities of bonds or improvement. At that time, they will be able to start construction of the public improvements. So imagine that even after six years, or uh, as it says here, extending up to six years, Let's say nothing happens. Well, city has the ability to take the property back or just leave it alone because nothing has happened on that site. It's still as it was when you approved the map. Does that does that help? Uh, I think so. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, and, and sorry, I, I, it was hard for me to really wrap wrap my head around this at first because my first instinct was no way uh, because the city's going to end up with a lot of property. Well, that's not the case. It, it really is, it's just to 
allow these landholders that are mom and pop farms been around for 100 years that really don't want to own it anymore and they want to be able to start selling off their property and mm -hmm. that they're not going to develop it, they want to sell it to a developer. Okay. So we're hoping it will incentivize them. Exactly. Because still, even if they come through, even if a developer comes through and says they want to do the lien agreement and we, we take forward when the map is recorded and we accept that, they still aren't going to do anything until they put those new bonds in place. So it's just encouraging the landowners to work with the developers to get them moving into that right direction. It's kind of getting them off zero. That's what that I need to know. Yeah. Good. Thank you. Sorry, I couldn't explain it. No, it's good. Mm -hmm. I'm good. That explained a couple things. That, oh, good. That, <laughs> that I was going to on this. It's like, okay, so what happens if nothing is done, and then where do we stand, and where do they stand? But it's more or less, as you said, an incentive and a tool that l larger landowners who are not developers can use to get their maps recorded so that they can be developed, and then everybody can get their money. Yeah. Okay. That, yes. that, that answered it in my head. So. Okay. If there are no more comments or questions, may I have a motion on item 9A to approve? Second. I have a motion by Councilmember Percival and a second by Councilmember Wright. May I have a roll call vote, please? Councilmember Meyer? Yes. Councilmember Percival? Yes. Councilmember Wright? Yes. Mayor Percent Krupa? Yes. Mayor Brown? Yes. That motion passes unanimously. Thank you very much, well, Steve. So the public teleconference line will now be deactivated. Remember to refer to hemetca.gov slash council chamber live if you want to continue to view the live stream. Okay, moving on, we have no presentations or receive and file items tonight, so we'll move on to the consent calendar. Are there any members of the council that would like to pull any consent calendar items for separate consideration? I'd like to pull 8C. And I'd like to pull 8B and 8B, actually. <laughs> oh, he's good. Okay, so I have a request to pull 8B, 8C, and 8D. May I have a motion on item 8A? So moved. Second. Okay. Okay. Roll call vote, please. Councilmember Meyer? Yes. Councilmember Bristol? Yes. Councilmember Wright? Yes. Mayor Bertram Krupa? Yes. Mayor Brown? Yes. <laughs> That passes 5-0. Um, Bonnie wanted to pull 8B. Yes. So on this um, SCADA system, this upgrade of the SCADA system, um, how far does this particular item, uh, in the amount of 58000 um, how long do they feel that this will service us and how soon will we need an upgrade? So I think we have either Charles or Tim that should be able to answer this question. Good evening, Honorable Mayor, members of Council. The, what is requested at this point in time is to migrate our new software onto the new hardware. The previous system lasted about eight years. Uh, this probably could last a similar amount of time. And uh, I, would, I would envision that uh, $58,000 would be for Tesco controls to migrate the entire software package over to our system and allow us to continue to monitor basically our, our wells as well as our tanks. And it provides a variety of um, sources for us to review um, uh, water flows, uh, chlorine levels, water levels, et cetera. And I wouldn't envision us having to upgrade this for some time. The reason I ask is because uh, the Bureau of Rec just released their uh, water and energy uh, funding program solicitation, and 
as you know, they do fund for SCADA. So I was wondering, and the interesting thing is that I was quite surprised to see that the deadline for this particular application is not until September, which is odd in itself because you normally only get six weeks. But I bring it up because if, in fact, we anticipate any more equipment or a more sophisticated SCADA system than we have now or we could use, then we may want to look at that particular funding option, especially since we have a few months to really think about it and how much it can cut. If I remember right, it's a $300,000 funding opportunity. I know just for the water system in general, the main priority is addressing the long-standing backlog of infrastructure that hasn't been taken care of for that system. And so for us, it's all prioritizing what needs to get done, the top priority being that critical infrastructure that, as you all know, we had that leak probably about a month ago or so. It seems like a month. So that's, you know, we're prioritizing what are the top things that need to be taken care of. But absolutely, when there's an opportunity to look at those funding opportunities, we will absolutely look at those. Normally those run $300,000 or a three-year program, a million. So it's something we need to look at because it will cover certainly a lot more than just SCADA systems. So a Bureau of Reclamation application is a little less daunting than the State Board. So we will definitely look at that. Linda? Your question, does that say not approve this and go for a grant funding? Or just as a heads up, there's additional grant funding dollars that we could probably be taking advantage of? Well, and I did put a call into the Bureau of State to ask that question, whether or not it could be read correctly. And some of these things are not in the Bureau of State. Some of these things are falling into the Bureau of State. Because for that very reason, and to see if we could come back and submit for that amount as well. And I haven't got a return phone call because they're understaffed as well. So in any event, there's a number of things to look at under this program. So thank you. Thank you, Council Member. The other thing, too, that I probably should have started off the meeting saying and disclosing is that based on the directives given by the governor as well as the county health officer, we've limited the agenda to only the items that are absolutely critical in nature. And so everything else that has deadlines, let's say in April or May, we haven't brought forward because we still have a little bit of time. The items before you are those critical items in nature that do require that. But I hear you loud and clear in terms of if there's an additional update that we need to do for the larger system, I think there is an opportunity that we can explore that you brought up. So I think that's the message that I got from what you brought up. Yes. Thank you. It's not that I wasn't going to approve the 58. It's just that we need to consider what's out there. Absolutely. Gotcha. It's always helpful to have your perspective and insight on water issues. And grant funding. Yeah. Any other comments or questions from Council? With that, may I have a motion on item 8B? I'll move to approve. Second. Okay. Roll call vote, please. Councilor Meyer? Yes. Councilor Percival? Yes. Councilor Wright? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Krupa? Yes. Mayor Brown? Yes. That passes unanimously. And item 8C. Michael? I pulled it because I need to recuse myself from a vote on this because I'm an agent for the owner of this property. Is this close to your new office? It's the exact same. So we'll have eagle eyes on the property. And I should probably even say that to you. And, Tom, do I need to recuse myself because this is close to my house? How close to your house is it? Really close. Okay. Thank you. 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 Thank you
really close, like six houses. Yes, I, I would recommend that you do so. That would still be three council members to participate in this item. Okay. Do you want me to note there's some typos in there? <laughs> <laughs> it makes it look like five million, and it's only like five thousand. Somebody needs to find that on page one. Okay, so Should we head for the back room? The record will reflect that Councilmember Percival and Councilmember Meyer are recusing themselves on item 8C. We have left the chambers. Okay, any discussion on item 8C? I will to the What Carly brought up, um, I forgot what page she said. With, it, with page one. Okay. I move to approve with corrections. I'll second that. Okay. I have a motion and a second to approve as corrected. Roll call vote, please. Council Member Wright? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Krupa? Yes. Mayor Brown? Yes. And that passes unanimously. 3 0. Okay. Uh, for the record, we have our two council members rejoining us at the dais. Moving on to item 8D. Bonnie, you wanted to pull that, yeah, but then you... I, was gonna, I did want to pull it, but now I, um, I choose not to. So. But, I'll, but I'll comment on it since I was going to pull it to you. Okay. Um, are we sure that we want to use this, this group again? Yes, we are. Do you have a question about the firm that we can answer? Um, yeah, I think ever since the very beginning when we used them, I gave them information, and so I have heartburn against them, and I don't appreciate them. So um, when we had, like, I don't know, maybe like three city managers ago, there were some questions that we had. And so as council members, the council members hire the auditing firm. And so for me to call and ask them a question and just, is this audited or is this not, instead of answering me, they went straight to the city manager. So if there's any shenanigans going on, hey, make sure you cover your tracks because she's calling. So That's I, how I felt. So Lorena can talk about the... So every time they send us the little thing, I write a nasty comment on there, just so you know, because so, I don't appreciate their services. Okay. I think Lorena can comment on the independence related to the auditing firm and the way that they've got to establish the relationships uh, even between city staff and city council. So, Lorena, do you mind commenting, providing some background on that, please? Good evening, Mayor and Council. Um, usually what happens is that they're supposed to maintain independence, and if they're in direct contact with council, then they're not maintaining that independence. Their job is to report back to you what they have found. So normally, I would say the same thing. I would say the exact same thing about their independence from the people that are actually doing the work because we are not doing the work. But they report back to you. So <clears throat> what normally happens with um, auditing firms is that municipalities or government agencies are recommended to change or to go out for RFP for for auditing services about every five years. We're coming up to those five years, and this would be the last extension that we would do, and then next year we would have to go to RFP. The reason we opted to do that, to go for an extension this year, as opposed to going to the RFP this year, is because, as you know, finance has suffered from a lot of turnover, a lot of uh, long-term employees that have recently retired, and when you change auditing firms, there's a lot that goes into it. There's a lot of um, starting all over with 
each firm. And with so many new people here, we're just trying to get everybody to a point where they're comfortable and understanding what they're doing before we make such a big change. I worked for a nonprofit and I was a director of operations. We were audited and our board of directors picked the auditing company and so I'm quite aware of how it works. But it is a poor excuse if they're not doing their job because we don't want to do it this year. That's not why we do it. Well, uh, um, Carla, I can understand your angst, but I've never known a, um, a auditing group that would have direct contact under these circumstances with the board or council. And, well, they could have contact, but they wouldn't report back to them. They'd report back to, for example, city manager. Or and, and I understand where you're coming from because of our past experience with city managers. But um, I will tell you this, that the um, – is it Poon? Poon. Poon group um, is a highly reputable group. I mean, it's – at the top, I, I don't. I mean, the district uses them, and they they don't. Uh... Yeah, the the Poon group. I, you're absolutely right, council member. The Poon group is one of these groups that comes in and will make um, sense of messes that are created within public agencies. Uh, this was the firm that came into San Bernardino uh, that was able to clear out their audits after they hadn't been due in two or three years. And so this group is known for going into those types of cities and making sense of what's there. And so you're absolutely right. This is a highly uh, reputable group, um, and they do have the history of going in. And I'm not saying that our city is one that has issues like that, but they are known uh, to come in and, and really report accurately to uh, the public and the governing board about uh, the financial uh, situation or the financial condition of a community. And, and it's only reasonable to think that they would go back to the one in charge for the response to a question by a council member. It's not that you can't ask a question, but they aren't going to respond to you personally under what I've been used to with auditing groups. My question was if our investments were audited or not, because our investments at the time, we were not following policy. We were not following our governing policy. And so in, to not get any answer from anybody, they failed to do their job in my book. So those investments still haven't been fixed. Those, like, little ones may have, but in all that we are doing and trying to get things done, we're still operating status quo. So three years, and they're still, you know, what are they doing with our stuff? Well, don't they just make the recommendations? They, and Lorena, please uh, chime in if needed. Their you know that they don't audit the investments, okay, because the council voted last year for a forensic audit of our investments, which has never been done. But So, so we know already. We already know that. But the, the fact is, is they still oversee somewhat and part of our investments at, on a very light level. Their job isn't to forensically audit uh, the city, uh, their job is to ensure that the statements that the city has prepared have been prepared in accordance with uh, governmentally accepted accounting principles. Is that correct, Lorena? Yes, and as far as investments, they, they do have a series of, of um, items that they do audit within the investments, but it's not a forensic audit of the investments by any means. They confirm that the ratings that the banks give them for any of our investments are accurate, but they don't um, give an opinion as to whether the city should or should not continue to invest in those. They make sure that the city is following the policy, but not to the point that they're checking every single audit or every single investment documentation to make sure that it falls within that. 
And that's why I have heartburn is because we were not following the policy and they okayed the audit. But that would require a different type of audit, not the citywide financial audit that, that they are contracted to perform. Any more questions, comments from council? Okay, I'll entertain a motion on item 8D. Move to approve. We have a motion to approve. And second. second. And we have a second. Roll call vote, please. Councilmember Meyer? No. Councilmember Percival? No. Councilmember Wright? Yes. Mayor Percent Grupo? Yes. Mayor Brown? Yes. Motion passes 3 2. Thank you, Loretta, for Lorena, for your uh, participation in that. Moving on to Thank you, Council. Moving on to uh, discussion action items. We have item 10A, an interim ordinance prohibiting the construction or operation of private detention centers and community detention facilities for unaccompanied minors in the city of Hemet. We have uh, our uh, community development director, Kang. You're going to give us the staff report on that? Sure. Um, Mayor and members of the council, uh, before you tonight is an interim ordinance that discusses the construction and, and operation of a private detention centers and community detention facilities for the unaccompanied minors in the city of Hemet. Uh, what this ordinance does is it provides a, a, a pause for 45 days uh, for us to investigate um, this type of impact that would have on the city. And um, we are also basing this on the Assembly Bill 32 um, which bans private prisons and detention facilities from operating in California. Um, we are scheduled to go forth on the Planning Commission uh, hearing on the uh, April 7th for this item to be presented, and then they will come back to you as a full ordinance. Um, and staff is available to answer any questions you may have. Well, thank you, HP. Uh, for the record, public comments for this item were uh, an opportunity to take those comments was earlier in the meeting, and we had no comments from the public. So do any members of council have comments or questions? I've got one question. I know we're doing this um, specifically for unaccompanied minors uh, in the city of Hemet. Um, is there any reason why we're not just doing this as a blanket? Blanket, blanket, excuse me, um, prohibition on any detention centers, whether it be for adults or minors. Tom, are you still on the line? I know Tom and HP worked together to uh, prepare this item. Uh, Tom, can you think of any uh, information that might be able to help uh, Council Member Percival? No, I, I believe the, the thought was um, there had been some conversation about a private de detention center uh, for unaccompanied minors, so that was the direction uh, as staff in my office reviewed the city's code, uh, and there were no uh, regulations specifically on that type of use, so the recommendation was uh, an urgency ordinance for that specific use. Um, as this item develops and as it goes through the planning commission process, if there is a desire to expand that scope, um, I think we could uh, accomplish that at that time. Okay, I just want to make sure that it would be appropriate for us to, um, I know to get through this one with the minors, but um, to be able to look at this maybe at the planning commission level that it be a blanket for any private detention facilities for any purpose. Sure. Uh, 
Chair, I think that's something that the Planning Commission can review. Okay, thank you. Um, I have a question also, um, and I actually, it's a few comments, but in the actual ordinance itself, besides addressing the problem, it, it, the first two whereas is ad addresses like what we're talking about, but then we have the third, the fourth, the fifth, the sixth, the seventh, the eighth, the ninth whereas, they are giving way too many editorial comments about like almost how we feel as a council. And so whereas a multitude of studies are alarming the status of private detention centers, it doesn't mean that a private, it does, it's, this isn't about a private or anything. This is, we don't want this to be here, right? A detention center. So there, there puts comments in here um, that probably shouldn't, I mean, we're voting on this. We're voting on this ordinance. Um, the Academy of Pediatrics concluded that n no time in detention is a child safe. So as a council, are we saying that we don't want, that we're against uh, juvenile detention centers? No, we're not saying that. So I don't know that all these comments need to be in here. Some juveniles need to go to detention centers. I'm just saying like, if a kid needs to go to juvenile hall, right, but um, you know what I'm saying? This is putting a little too much in here that we're voting on. We just need to stick to the facts at hand. Like number five, it talks about the low income of the immigrant communities in Southern California. Why are we talking about that? Uh, that's not our topic. You know what I'm saying? Can you answer that? So I know legal um, and, Tom, and so, oh, go ahead, Tom. Yeah, so legal prepared it, so Tom can shed light on that. Sure, so part of the reason whenever uh, a city prepares an interim urgency ordinance such as this one, there are some legal findings that need to be made. And one of those legal findings is that there is uh, an, an urgency or um, you know, some, some harm that, that may come to the, to the city. And so we typically prepare these ordinances to have uh, facts to support the urgency in that we have separate studies to show that if this type of a use were to be uh, processed without any city regulations, there, there is some harm to the public health or safety or welfare that, that could result. Um, and so that's why some of these statements are in there and these studies are attached to support that statement. Um, if you would like to soften or, or discuss some of those statements, we can, we can modify that. But as a, uh, to, to clear some of the legal thresholds, that's why my office will put in those types of statements and these types of studies. I mean, this, <laughs> I don't even know if I can say this. This looks like we just pulled it right down from the governor's office. I mean, this is crazy. I mean, the, the other part, the, what about on, let's see, page 1, 24, 25, 26, the negative impact on adults going to jail. I mean, do we need to close our jail or that we have in our city? We're, we're saying something here. Words mean things. I, I, we need to pass this ordinance, but we just need to pass it on what, why we're, what the problems are. So I think as Tom mentioned, if the council has some uh, areas where they would like to soften, as uh, Tom mentioned. Uh, I think soften is a poor word. I don't do anything soft. Tom, what are the recommendations that could be replaced with some of the concerns that are being conveyed? I, I understand that there's a need to include the um, thresholds that are there, so how much flexibility is there? And, and think about that one for a minute, Tom, but here's another question for you. So on page two, the 17, 18, 19, it says that these are already prohibited under assembly bill, is this, is this what I'm reading? We have that, and then also the next one, it talks about that it doesn't, it's not permissible in our city codes. 
So when you, you, you see what I'm asking, and the, but we need to still do another one on top of it, even if we already have a, a rule. Yeah. Not allowing so it? the reason why that statement's in there, it is there is there is a provision in the in the city code in the city zoning ordinance that says if a use, any kind of a land use is not specifically listed, then it is prohibited. Um, so this type of a land use is not listed, uh, but then it creates some ambiguity because the next layer of analysis is uh, is for the, the planning department to review whether there is a use that is substantially similar uh, to the use that's not listed. And then you find the closest use and uh, apply the land use regulations to that closest use. So it just creates some... Uh, some questions, some ambiguity. So the clearest way, mm -hmm. and the clearest way courts will look at is whether the city has adopted this type of a uh, urgency ordinance prohibiting that type of use, and then it's explicit, and then it's clear, and we remove that ambiguity. Okay, I understand that. Tom, uh, I understand this is an uh, proposed as an urgency ordinance, and it would expire in 45 days if uh, no other replacement ordinance is written. And I understand what uh, Councilmember Meyer is alluding to, but I also understand that in order to qualify as uh, an urgency uh, ordinance, that has to meet certain thresholds. So I understand that there has to be verbiage included in the resolution that that makes that case but just for clarification uh, if this passes it's going to be totally replaced by the next ordinance that's brought before council uh, to consider correct correct it will it will go into into effect immediately um, other ordinances have to have a first reading and a second reading, but this ordinance would go into effect uh, upon approval. Then it would be valid for 45 days, and it would expire unless it is extended by another action of the council. At the same time, uh, the Planning Commission can hold a hearing on an ordinance uh, similar to this one, and they would then um, recommend that to the council who then you all would hold another hearing on the recommendation from the planning commission, which would not need all of these uh, urgency whereas sections. And, and uh, I think that might address your concern when we get to that point where we have- I can't vote on orders. something that is saying something that we do the opposite of. That's what I'm just trying to say. Um, we put people in jail. We have a jail. The city has a jail. Um, Mike, uh, Tom, what about um, the, the one, two, the third, fourth, and fifth whereases? Those are the worst ones, okay? What page? Uh, one, line seven, starting at line 17. Uh, if you look at that whereas, that one is talking about privately owned uh, immigration detention centers with poor living conditions. Those are facts that you have right here? So with the, the, let's see, it's the third, fourth, and fifth whereas sections, again, my office places those in there to meet certain legal thresholds. If you want to remove those or reword those, then the risk is the ordinance may not survive a, a challenge. Now, uh, I think surviving a challenge is, is mitigated or reduced based upon the fact that we are going through a simultaneous process to also adopt a permanent ordinance by going through planning commission and to city council as, as a backup, if you will. So if you wanted to remove those whereas sections, again, I think it would reduce the, uh, uh, the effectiveness of the legal threshold to show that there is an urgency, but if it's something that the council is uncomfortable with, then it can be removed. Um, okay, now what about I will just... also note. Yeah. Go ahead. Just, I will also note an urgency ordinance needs a four-fifths vote to be adopted. 
Oh, okay. What about um, the if you if, look at the, all of these? Okay, the one if the the worst one is the very last one on page one. That's the one that actually talks about putting adults in jail. What if we just struck that one? The one that says whereas an April 2017 report, that one? Yeah. I mean, the other one is. No, I think that would be fine. The next one is like it's stating that that's from UCLA. So it's a report. What you're talking about is a report, too. It's a 20, April 2017 report by the American Academy of Pediatrics. Oh, it's their, what they found, all of these whereases are from actual reports that somebody else found. It's not what we're saying. Right. It's but we're still approving it. it. Well, it, putting it, it in our ordinance. It substantiates what, why this is an urgency order. But, but it's all. Yeah. If I could real quick. Um, I just want to point out that this is for privately run not detention us. centers, not right. government run jails and prisons. We, we all know that bad people need to be put away. But that report, the pediatric one, does, it refers to all detention centers. So it doesn't refer to, it doesn't spe specify. So that's why I'm saying maybe that one could go and then we could. Tom, if I understood what you said, that, that particular whereas that starts at line 23 on page 1, that one could be removed without uh, adversely affecting the urgency uh, requirement. It, it, it may reduce the effectiveness, but we still would have other facts and other statements and other reports that would still support urgency. Well, I, I have to agree with the, the comment that Council Member Percival made that we're talking about a very specific type of a detention facility that would be privately operated. And, and those were the things that the, the state attempted to outlaw because of concerns about privately operated. And I certainly concur that our objective is to have make use of penal codes and, and other uh, codes that are at our disposal for our law enforcement officers to enforce and locate and apprehend and successfully prosecute criminals. But if we need to have certain verbiage in to constitute an urgency ordinance, and based on my understanding of what has brought this before us tonight, I think there is an urgency to get something passed to head that off. And I'd rather be safe than sorry. And, and, I, and, I, and I don't disagree with the concerns that Councilmember Meyer has on the, uh, some of the, the terminology and the references made in this, but those could all be uh, appropriately addressed through the Planning Commission process and ultimately getting uh, another ordinance uh, to us to review and approve. So, if there are no more comments, I will uh, ask if somebody wants to make a motion on item 10A. I move to approve. I have a motion to approve. A second. And I have a second. Roll call vote, please. Councilmember Meyer. I'm going to state for the record that I believe that we need this ordinance. But I do. I can't stand behind all the whereases in here. So no. Councilmember Percival. Yes. Councilmember Wright. Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Krupa. Yes. Mayor Brown. Yes. 